the smell of it. It just it stays. And a lot of our houses have been polluted because of the backup. Tonight, upgrading water systems in Alberta. But is it enough when reserves are prone to flooding? It's to show like the younger generations of girls that there's not just office jobs and like hairstylists. You could do this kind of work, like it is possible. A Cree nation in Alberta builds skills while creating first-time homes for elders. So we see this kind of continued control of Indigenous narratives by people who have become experts on us. And a look at what Canadian universities profess to be. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. It was a win for Kinder Morgan yesterday as the British Columbia Supreme Court threw out challenges made by the Squamish Nation and the City of Vancouver, who both oppose the Trans Mountain Pipeline project. Our Amber Bernard has reaction from the Squamish Nation over the decision. At a press conference Thursday, the Squamish Nation made clear their reaction to the B.C. Supreme Court's decision to dismiss their challenge against building the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. On behalf of the Squamish Nation and the Squamish Nation Council, we are here to say that we are greatly disappointed by the decision today from the B.C. Supreme Court. In 2017, the Squamish Nation challenged the former Liberal provincial government's decision to greenlight the pipeline, which would triple the flow of oil from Alberta. That oil then would be shipped by tanker through the Burrard Inlet to Asian markets. The inlet currently sees about five tankers a month, but the expansion could result in 35 tankers of diluted bitumen a month. And the concern is the risk of a spill could increase. Burrard Inlet is a home to the Squamish people. The Burrard Inlet, the English Bay and the Salish Sea is our home. And we will continue to fight and protect that home. The Supreme Court was reviewing whether the government had adequately consulted the nation and if they had addressed their land rights. We challenged the B.C. government in their approval of the Kinder Morgan pipeline because we felt that our rights as an Indigenous people were not being respected. Uh, and we challenged their approval and their issuing of an environmental certificate without properly engaging our nation uh, in respecting our rights as a people. The Supreme Court also dismissed the City of Vancouver's challenge to the pipeline. The legal challenges are just two of several hanging over Kinder Morgan, but this loss is a blow to the Squamish nation. They say the fight isn't over yet. So we will continue that fight in the Federal Court of Appeal, uh, and we look forward to that decision. Today, the B.C. Supreme Court judge reiterated that the Federal Court of Appeal is a much more significant decision. The Squamish Nation has 30 days to file in the Federal Court of Appeal. Amber Bernard, APTN National News, Vancouver. Tracking Trans Mountain is the name of a new database we're co-producing with the Discourse in HuffPost Canada. The database looks at how Indigenous communities are affected by Kinder Morgan's expansion proposal. APTN's Lucy Scully traveled the pipeline route from Burnaby, BC to Edmonton, Alberta, and she's now working on the database. Lucy, thanks for joining us. Can you speak a little bit about the goal for this project? So we really wanted to paint a clear picture of the pipeline consultations because there's been so much conflicting information out there about which uh, Indigenous communities are for and against, which have signed agreements or not. Uh, Kinder Morgan has come out and said that 43 Indigenous communities have signed agreements uh, for the pipeline project. But as we've learned, that doesn't necessarily mean that those communities fully support the pipeline. In some cases, even the chiefs of those communities themselves don't support the pipeline, even though they have signed agreements. So we really want to show the complexities of the project. And so we put all this information into an interactive map that's easy to read. And so how did you compile the information for that map? So we used, we gleaned as much information as we could from supporting documents from, uh, for example, the National Energy Board, but we also reached out to uh, more than 130 First Nation and Métis communities along the pipeline route. Uh, basically, we wanted to hear directly from them. We wanted to know why they did or did not sign agreements. We wanted to know how they came to that decision as a community. And we wanted to know if they thought that the consultation was meaningful. And so what's next for this project? 
So this map is still a work in progress. Uh, if you go online and, and click through it, you'll see that some information might not be there. Um, maybe you disagree with some of the information that we have on our website uh, on this map. Uh, so we've left the door open. We're inviting people to weigh in. If you are from a community that, uh, that we've reached out to and you disagree with the information, you see information missing, you can click on a link and fill out a survey. Uh, as well, we are expect expecting to have more stories come as a result of this map, so stay tuned for that. Looking forward to those stories. It's a great idea. Lucy, appreciate you taking some time to speak with us about it. Thank you. And you can go to aptnnews.ca to have a look at the tracking Trans Mountain database. That's where you'll find the interactive map and other stories on Kinder Morgan's pipeline. And we would like to hear what you have to say about that or any other story. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page. Follow us on Twitter at APTN News or go to that website, aptnnews.ca. It's no secret Indigenous groups believe Bill C-45, the cannabis law, is being rushed through Parliament. They say they haven't been consulted adequately. It's currently before the Senate. And today, senior bureaucrats and senators discussed proposed amendments. One of them is to del delay the bill from being implemented for one year. A conservative senator said little consultation was done with Indigenous people before the bill was drafted. It was a roundtable in Vancouver with, the, with uh, uh, Madame McClellan's task force. There was a phone call. Uh, on multiple issues to the head of ITK, and this was one of the items on the phone call, according to the head of ITK himself. And, but it was listed as pre-drafting consultation. Nothing else. I asked the minister uh, at our committee, is there one word in this, in this bill that has anything to do or has been influenced by the consultation that took place and got no answer? Still, First Nations across Canada are readying themselves for the eventual legalization of recreational cannabis. And as Ganawage is discovering, ironing out the kinks in a new industry is proving to be tricky. Tom Fenario has a story. Upon entering Ganawage Mohawk territory, one of the first things you'll see are cigarette shops. For decades, the tobacco trade has been one of the main economic engines here. While it provides jobs, tobacco remains untaxed and unregulated by the Mohawk Council of Ganawage. And now that they're eyeing the recreational cannabis trade, they want to ensure a cut of the profits. For us, it's an opportunity to um, delve into you know, the um, industry and look at what's available as far as a communal benefit. Council Chief Gina Deer helped draft this cannabis control law that aims to regulate the sale, production and use of the drug. It contains provisions that will tax non-Indigenous customers as well as demand mandatory contributions from cannabis entrepreneurs. We need to create the legislation to ensure that you know, our concerns are protected and, and covered across the board. Um, it's not going to be a free-for-all. This law is uh, it's, it's a horrible law if, if you read it. Jeremiah Johnson says the law gives council too much power. He points to the proposed creation of a cannabis control board that will be separate from council, yet appointed by them instead of elected by the community. I would recommend honestly that community uh, pressure council to recategorize this law as a type one law so that the community has a say, has a binding say on what this law becomes. Currently, the cannabis control law is considered a type two regulatory law meaning that council doesn't need to consult the community as much as a type 1 law. Tanya Williams works in Ganawage's public safety department and is running for council this summer. She says the law has too much power over people's individual freedom and thinks consultation wasn't adequate. Whether it be a kiosk, whether it be a, a survey, whether it be door to door, you have to have several ways in which you're engaging with the community and you actually have to take all that data and turn it into a report and allow the community to see. So there's a process with consultation that's not being understood and it's not being exercised. Deer says members can still share feedback at an upcoming hearing of the law. Generally it's um, a one session. Uh, we had explained to community members 
if at the session it goes over and we need to continue and have other sessions because of an areas of concerns, we will do that. One thing is certain, everyone here will eventually have to get on the same page before cannabis can become a new cash crop. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Kahnawake, Mohawk Territory. In northern communities that don't have RCMP, witness statements and community testimony can be an important part of a case. But what happens if there is no preliminary hearings? That's what one Yellowknife defense lawyer is speaking out against in the face of a new federal crime bill. Our reporter Charlotte Morton Jacobs has more. To address intimate partner violence by increasing maximum penalties and implementing... This spring, the federal government tabled Bill C-75, which is supposed to help victims of domestic violence by reducing court delays and the ways juries are selected. The bill would also reduce preliminary inquiries. That change might work for southern communities, but it might not be suited to some northern communities that rely on those preliminary inquiries. Carolyn Wozniak is a lawyer in Yellowknife and has been practicing in the North for over a decade. And she is concerned. Reducing the number of offenses, the number of types of offenses that would be eligible to get a preliminary inquiry and restricting it to only the most serious of offenses. And so in the Northwest Territories, uh, that would mean that a lot of the offenses right now, sexual offenses in particular, would no longer be eligible to get uh, preliminary inquiries. In 2017, there were 147 sexual assault cases filed with the territorial courts. Out of 33 communities, there are 12 in the NWT without police detachments. Instead, there is a community policing plan developed with the leaders in the town. If there has been an incident or a crime committed, what kind of evidence is being gathered and when and how? And if the RCP can't even be there present immediately, there's a delay of time, uh, there's, it's just undoubtedly more challenging to them. And that continues to then impact going down the line of the evidence that's available to the prosecutors or to the defense. Wozniak says preliminary inquiries are a way to ask witnesses more in-depth questions, especially for communities where police were not present in the case right away. Wozniak says the bill is not a move towards restorative justice. Something that's missing is that there's not been a lot of changes to the pre-existing mandatory minimum sentences, which is something that a lot of people were expecting this government to, to do, and they've been suggesting that they will do, as well as changes to restorative justice programs, which again is something that the, the government currently has been suggesting they would be doing, but it's not found in the current bill. The North holds some of the highest rates of Indigenous incarceration with few alternatives to probation and jail time. APTN reached out to the Territorial Department of Justice weeks before airtime, but were denied an interview. Instead, we were given this statement saying that the GNWT would perform an analysis on the proposed legislation of Bill C-75 to prepare for any changes that would affect court services in the Northwest Territories. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. Residents of the Samson Cree Nation in Alberta are celebrating the announcement of a new wastewater treatment system. They're hopeful the new facility will finally give them clean water. APTN's Chris Stewart was at the announcement. Samson Cree Nation has long had problems with having clean water. Many residents are forced to import their drinking water. One of the problems is that the septic system is failing. Originally designed for 2,000 people, it is now handling 11,000 residents. Kathleen Swampy is a counselor at Sampson Cree. She says roads and houses are regularly being flooded with raw sewage. A flooding would occur at least five or six times a year. Uh, this would damage the infrastructure we have. Our roads would be damaged. Our houses would be damaged. A lot of the houses have cellars. They would fill with backup as if it was a normal routine thing. Kathleen's mother, Albina Bruno, has lived here over 60 years. She says that for decades, the raw sewage has been hurting the community. It's been seeping into the ground, and we're drinking that, you know, which is really disgusting because, you know, the smell of it, it just, it stays. And a lot of our houses have been polluted because of the backup. But that situation could be changing soon. Last week, the federal government announced a $32.5 million investment in a new water sewage treatment system. The new system will accommodate up to 25,000 residents, and it should improve their water quality. 
The new system will be built and run mostly by local residents. Yeah, Councillor yeah, Vincent yeah. Saddleback says the days of seeing sick band members will hopefully be over. And with the, wa the wastewater definitely affects our drinking water. You know, uh, and it's definitely a health issue. You know, we have uh, First Nations members going to the hospital with unexplained rashes, you know. We have uh, health issues. We have all these hosp uh, unnecessary hospital visits. The new treatment plant will be operational in 2020. It's going to certainly make a big difference for our community. A cleaner air, cleaner water, and I really am happy about it. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Samson Cree Nation, Alberta. Time to take a quick break, and then we'll look at how universities are being decolonized. Here's a look at Saturday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. 20 for Halifax, 11 in Charlottetown. A sunny high of 7 in La Grande, 1 degree warmer for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Sunny skies in 17 in Quebec City and Saguenay. Rain in 18 in Montreal. Cloudy but hot across much of southern Ontario. 29 in Toronto, 30 in Peterborough. Rain in 17 in Sudbury. Rain on the way for Sioux Lookout with a high of 21. In northern Manitoba, 17 in Norway House and Island Lake. Sunny in 27 for Brandon, 24 in Winnipeg and Dauphin. Rain for parts of Saskatchewan, including Saskatoon, with a high of 25. Rain in 23 in North Battleford. 21 on Saturday in Meadow Lake and Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. More Indigenous teachers, students, spaces and courses. Just some of the things being done to indigenize Canadian universities. But one Métis scholar says that may not be enough. APTN's Justin Brake has more. Zoe Todd was hired by Carleton University in 2015 as part of an effort to bring in more Indigenous faculty. She commends schools taking steps to address the inequities Indigenous people face in post-secondary education, but says they must do more. I do think it's important for us to talk about the difference between indigenizing the academy, which flows out of sort of this reconciliation discourse and is really a response to the TRC calls to action, and the broader question of decolonizing, which is about addressing the underlying structures of the university that have excluded historically and contemporarily. Earlier this month, Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax came under fire. A white professor, Dr. Martha Walls, is slated to teach a history course she designed on residential schools. Critics say Indigenous teachers can offer knowledge rooted in lived experience and that Indigenous people should be telling their own histories. Others disagree. Our mission is to uh, defend and promote academic freedom. Mark Mercer is a philosophy professor at St. Mary's University and president of the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. Academic decisions should be made on academic grounds alone, and that things like race and gender, ethnicity, are not academic grounds. Mercer says maintaining academic freedom includes allowing departments to choose their own faculty. We uh, don't uh, support um, um, targeted hirings or um, you know, the attempt to uh, um, uh, 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 bring people in on the basis of anything other than um, their teaching ability and their, their, their research ability. Mount St. Vincent said in a statement that Indigenous faculty and staff at the Mount believe that true allies committed to honest reconciliation, like Dr. Walls, must be engaged in sharing knowledge of First Nations Canadian history in order to reach all those in education who should be reached with this important information. Dr. Walls declined our interview request. Todd says she respects the Indigenous voices that have spoken about the Mount St. Vincent matter, but says a broader problem still exists. Historically, indig uh, Indigenous people have not had a lot of say in what kind of research was done on our communities, what was done with our material culture, what was done even with our blood and our um, sort of like physical bodies. Uh, so we see this kind of continued control of Indigenous narratives by people who have become experts on us but are not necessarily part of our communities. Mercer said he wasn't aware of the distinction between indigenizing and decolonizing but that his group was adamant university departments choose who teaches a course and who doesn't. Mount St. Vincent University said no one was available for an interview. Justin Brake, APTN National News, Halifax. A group of high school students in Alberta are helping address the housing crunch on a First Nation. That story's coming up after the break.
Here's the rest of Saturday's weather outlook picking back up in northern Alberta. 18 in High Level, Fort Chippewa and Peace River. 23 in Edmonton, 24 in Lethbridge, 25 in Medicine Hat. In British Columbia, sunny and 25 in Penticton. 26 under the sun in Kamloops. 10 in Deese Lake, Smithers and Prince Rupert where rain is expected. Cloudy across the Yukon, 14 in Beaver Creek, a high of just 2 in Rock River. In NWT, 20 in Fort Liard and Fort Simpson, 10 for Norman Wells. Minus 2 in Saks Harbor, plus 2 in Inuvik and Fort McPherson. In Nunavut, snow and minus 1 in Whale Cove and Repulse Bay. Minus 2 in Cape Dorset, Iqaluit and Hangar Tongue. Welcome back. A group of high school students in Alberta are taking on the lack of housing on First Nations by building custom tiny homes from the ground up. And as APTN's Tamara Pimentel explains, the first tiny house is making one person's dream a reality. Oh, such a beautiful day today. 70-year-old Joyce Little Mustache has never dreamed of having her own home until now. Uh, time gets closer, it's getting more exciting. <laughs> Right now she lives in the senior residence on Pikani Nation. I just lived here, there, and rent, paid rent. I never thought I'd get a new house home for myself. This soon-to-be-completed tiny home is designed just for her. In just five weeks, it was built from the ground up by high school students. It's part of a pilot program aimed to address the housing crisis on First Nations particularly for single adults. Currently, there are roughly 420 homes on Bikani with a population of over 2,500. Living on our First Nations Reserve, I find like we lack housing a lot. Like I know in a lot of different reservations, they lack housing as well. Alina Crow is one of 12 students involved in the build. For her, it's more than just a school project. Learning just like these simple skills, like even if you don't pursue a career in this, like you know that skill and if something comes up in your family, you could be the one to fix that. The federally funded project was launched in mid-April with the help of Your Choice Home. Jay Noel is a program manager. By the end of the program, once the students are done, they're going to get their high school apprenticeship hours, they're, or they're going to get their apprenticeship hours, their high school credits, and a paycheck. A paycheck, along with hands-on experience. It was different from being in a classroom and like actually getting like hands-on work. It sort of just helped us bond and create a better friendship. Uh, through just building and just communicating with each other. It was to show like the younger generations of girls that there's not just office jobs and like care stylists. You could do this kind of work like it is possible. As the finishing touches are being completed, Little Mustache imagines a home to hold family gatherings and a space to work on her sewing. And she gives these youth credit for making that dream a reality. Learning, um, say, getting a lot of knowledge and skills with this, having the opportunity, and I'm very happy for them. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Bikani Nation. What a great program and a great way to cap off the show in the week. You can tune in Sunday for APTN National News Weekend. Stick around, Cows and Plows is next on the season finale of APTN Investigates. I'm Dennis Ward, have a great night.